At First Things First, our mission is early childhood, and it's more important to our state than ever. By focusing on the early years, we help Arizona's children reach their full potential. Quality early learning impacts more than the individual child. Schools benefit from more prepared students, businesses with more qualified employees, and communities with engaged citizens. Investments made in the early years today last for decades. Join the First Things First mission and learn more at azchildhoods.com. It's time for today's Lucky Land Horoscope with Victoria Cash. Life's gotten mundane, so shake up the daily routine and be adventurous with a trip to Lucky Land. You know what they say, your chance to win starts with a spin. So go to LuckyLandSlots.com to play over 100 social casino-style games for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Get lucky today at LuckyLandSlots.com. Available to players in the U.S., excluding Washington and Michigan. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void or prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. It's time for today's Lucky Land Horoscope with Victoria Cash. Life's gotten mundane, so shake up the daily routine and be adventurous with a trip to Lucky Land. You know what they say. Your chance to win starts with a spin. So go to LuckyLandSlots.com to play over 100 social casino-style games for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Get lucky today. At LuckyLandSlots.com. Available to players in the U.S., excluding Washington and Michigan. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void or prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. You're in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. So neighbors, I've just gotten some sad news. The original co-host of the Paracast, David Biedney, died recently. He was an incredible character. He worked with me early to establish the Paracast is the gold standard of paranormal radio. He will be missed. We plan to have a special memorial episode for David Biedney in the very near future. So as most of you know, this is our second episode on the new network structure. What this means is that the audio quality is better, especially on my guests. I never seem to change. And there are fewer ads. The guests today and we anticipate this gentleman is Gareth Reese. And Gareth is very much interested in modern myths and folklore. Your country, Gareth, seems to be infused by. That's certainly true, yes. And what I was interested in is the way that that folklore continues through urbanization and the modern culture. Is this in the sense of seeing strange things still that are related to the strange things? people saw it many years ago? It's partially a seepage of the past into the present. So, for example, in a modern housing estate, an industrial park, sort of the sightings of ghosts and poltergeists and werewolves. But it's also, I'm interested in the way that we story the landscapes in our locale, no matter what kind of landscape, no matter how sort of ugly or mundane or, or, or modernised they are. We story those places. And a lot of the structures and modern structures of the mid-20th century have become kind of crumbled and old and they've had so many layers of experience on them that they've become kind of mythological in their own right. I'm kind of interested in that ongoing story we tell about ourselves, our personal lives and our communities that create a kind of ongoing folklore. Well, one thing I notice here in terms of construction of things, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and I lived in a four-family brownstone. And that structure built before World War II is still there. No doubt it's been remodeled. It is hugely expensive, like $3,000 for a two-bedroom, one-bathroom apartment. I mean, really expensive. It was very Ooh. cheap when we lived there. But it's still there. It's still that building. Whereas all these beautiful stucco homes here in Arizona, they're falling apart yeah. before they ever reach that age. Well, there's a bit of that. There's the, those old buildings that, that retain, retain that history. And, and certainly we have a lot of those and these kind of very sturdy Georgian and Victorian buildings. And they're kind of what I would call naturally haunted in the sense that we've kind of had so many ghost stories and films made about these sorts of buildings that people kind of expect 
to be haunted in an old Victorian house. But there are also lots of stories of modern places, new builds that have existed only for, you know, 30, 40 years that seem to attract these kind of events. Sometimes because they're built sort of near old mine shafts or they're built in old sites of old wells or sites of kind of hangings from the past. Because in Britain, we have that, the space is so dense that we have to densely layer it. So things go on top of other things to create this kind of strange layering. And I think that's one of the reasons. But also I'm kind of interested in the way that this idea of the genus loci, that spirit of place. So for example, I wrote a story about the Hackney Marshes near where I lived, where there, there was an old toy factory. I used to walk past and it was it was it was abandoned about 20, 30 years before. And it was all knocked down in front of my eyes. And then they built this new build place called Matchmaker Wharf. And it was exactly in the imprint of the old factory. And for me, I could see the overlay between the two things. So I started to write a story about how maybe the people in this new build can be haunted by the, the spirit of that place from the past. And those kind of stories sort of energize me when I see places that have been knocked down but rebuilt on the same kind of uh, location. For my imagination, quite interesting. What about the reality? Does that happen in the real world, that strange things occur when a house or a location has that kind of history? Certainly in the cases of certain housing estates built on the sites of, so for example, up in the north of England, I went to a place called Grimsby, which is quite a deprived um, coastal town. There was a housing estate built after the war, Second World War, called Nunsthorpe. It was built on, as, as you can imagine, on a place, an old nunnery and a place of some holy significance. Several sightings of monk-like figures, religious figures, a headless nun. And whether this is because the people are aware of the past of the place or, you know, there is something seeping through that, that fascinates me. And these are not people who are necessarily deep into the history. These are just people trying to get on with their lives in kind of quite, quite sort of cheap council housing. So, yeah, there's a few examples of that. Do you find that people who report these things know about such events or are new to them? From the reading I did, from especially the sort of 70s and 80s stuff, it seems not. Most of the people who who have the accounts, particularly in the sort of the council estate hauntings of the 70s and 80s, there's quite a few famous ones like the Enfield haunting in London, where sustained periods of poltergeist activity happening to families who had absolutely no interest in bringing these things to the fore and absolutely no interest in kind of researching these kind of ideas, uh, having these things happening to them to the point where they're, you know, they're distressed about it or they have to move home or they have to make significant changes in their lives. So they're not really motivated necessarily by dredging up the past or trying to, like I do, connect eras to each other. Well, when did you start looking into folklore? So I I was kind of like a, a regular Londoner. I was just, uh, you know, traveling around to work and to the pub and, and to parties in my sort of 20s and early 30s. And I got married and settled down and moved to a place in Hackney, which is in northeast London. It's right on the border of an area called the Lee Valley. And it's this River Lee that comes cuts right south through London, right through the city towards the Thames. It's a really strange place because there are parts of it have been untouched since the Ice Age. There are parts of it that are ancient medieval pasture land uh, called Lammas Land, where people used to graze their cattle. So places of huge cultural importance. Then it became the heart of the Industrial Revolution. It was a place where all the lots of the river was canalized and there was there were warehouses built and factories. It was a place where guns were put during the Blitz to fire on the enemy when they came overhead. And so it has the, there's bomb craters there. There's all kinds of like bits and pieces of, of, of the past all kind of jumbled together in this very strange landscape that is almost like walking through a dream. You walk through these sort of little tank um, bits of tank and like bits of bomb crater, but also these sort of superstructures of like a flyover coming over a woodland and a crumbled down warehouse and then an old copper mill, electricity pylons kind of cutting through it. So this was this landscape that I sort of fell in love with. And every day I would walk the dog through this incredible place feeling like Alice in Wonderland. It was like I'd, I'd take maybe a two hour break from my copywriting and I'd headed to this place that just seemed like I was entering into a different world. As soon as I crossed the river, it was this magical place. And I started to blog about it. I started to kind of just write little blog posts on a thing called the Marshman Chronicles, which was inspired by Ray Bradbury's stories about Mars, because it felt like I was in an alien place that was familiar, but really unfamiliar. As I sort of started to put up these blog posts, some of the stories were things that I was sort of making up, I guess. I was mapping it my own way because it hadn't really been written about. And other things I started to pick up on stories like the, it seemed to be haunted by a bear. Um, so in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, there was these bear sightings and these children famously stumbled upon a bear that kind of attacked them. And they ran across the river and there were these helicopters and big searches for it. There was before the Olympics, because uh, this is the area where the London Olympics in 2012 was kind of held. There were sightings of a crocodile, geese being pulled under the water. So it felt like there were suddenly these sort of cryptozoological things going on in this place. 
And partly, I think it was because you have in this heartland of London, in this urban sprawl, you've got this prehistoric place where people are kind of just walking away from kind of the urban structures that they know into a land where you know, anything can happen, where sort of things move in the undergrowth and where there's things that are invisible and unseen. And so it became fascinating for me. And so that's when I began to write my first book called Marshland, which was a what I call a deep map of a place in which I combined the things that I was feeling and my imagination, along with stories that I was picking up from the from the community and sort of rumours and myths, as well as some of the historical facts about the place. And my, in my view, the stories that people tell about a place and the rumours and misdirection, I think are, for me, as interesting as the geography and the history. So we call a book like that fact fiction then? Well, it was one of these things where I, I wrote it with a, a new publisher and it was quite experimental. And yeah, it, the, the problem with it was no one knew where to put it on the bookshelf because it's, you know, there's a reissue coming out this year and, the, and my publisher said, what are we going to do? Is it fiction or nonfiction? I was like, well, it's kind of, it's my view in the, of my view of how we experience reality is that we experience both of these things together and how we experience a place is about its sort of strange resonances and, and that's the senses of fear and foreboding and joy and elation and the stories people tell about it that make a place for me. And so I guess... I was trying to blend the two and I think some people got that and other people found it confusing but I you know I feel like it was it was the best way to describe this really strange uncanny landscape that was on my doorstep. We're going to look more at that landscape with Gareth Jean. Tim you're in The Paracast. <laughs> At First Things First, our mission is early childhood, and it's more important to our state than ever. By focusing on the early years, we help Arizona's children reach their full potential. Quality early learning impacts more than the individual child. Schools benefit from more prepared students, businesses with more qualified employees, and communities with engaged citizens. Investments made in the early years today last for decades. Join the First Things First mission and learn more at azchildhoods.com. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere. And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Of the books you've written, are any strictly 100% factual? Uh, yes. So Unofficial Britain, which is, my exp is a kind of extended essay exploration of the ideas that I'm talking about and the way that mythology and, and folklore attach themselves to places. That's a nonfiction book. And Car Park Life, uh, which is basically my exploration of supermarket car parks and retail spaces in Britain. That's all factual as well. And my new book, Sunken Lands, is all factual. So that's the kind of my notion of the, the folklore of, of floods and the weird resonances of um, half sunken or partially vis visible places. That's a factual book as well. Does that mean there's something mystical, mystical properties in flooding? I think that there are deep resonances with flooded places to do with how our experiences go back into the deep Holocene um, post uh, the end of the Ice Age and how a lot of our three Abrahamic religions and a lot of our folklore, and particularly a, North, a lot of North American folklore, is related to floods and catastrophic climate and uh, geological events going all the way to Atlantis as well with Plato and how these are fed into a kind of cultural consciousness. And when you go into these sort of places and you hear these stories, they kind of, they build up a kind of narrative that I was interested in telling that story, linking basically factual experiences from forgotten history, I guess, with how we live now and trying to link it to climate change and, and flooding in the present day. And I think those sort of sunken places, particularly around Britain, where we've got um, a kind of coastal shelf of submerged land with lots of these sort of ghost forests and remnants are quite evocative for people. I think they instigate this sort of primal memory of something that we've lost. Tim? There does seem to be a a cultural resonance when it comes to flooding. I don't think that there is a single ancient society that doesn't have some kind of myth about flooding. 
I mean, you know, naturally, uh, we know about the uh, the stories of Noah's flood in the Bible, but you look at all the different places across the planet, and every one of them has stories about a catastrophic, if not several, catastrophic floods. That's true. And it's startling how many. There's over 2,000 known flood myths. And like I say, they formed the foundations of major main religions, but they also formed sort of a lot of the stories and, and sort of philosophy and culture as well. And there's a lot of evidence that there was this huge amount of trauma um, in that kind of period of rapid warming after the end of the Ice Age that not only created floods when proglacial lakes uh, would burst, creating sort of almost mega floods, but also lots of sort of smaller events and also this uh, phenomenon of isostatic pressure, of isostatic movement, where big colossal sheets of ice move away from off the land and then create this bounce as the plates kind of rebalance, creating tectonic shifts, uh, volcanic eruptions and stuff. And this this kind of cataclysmic background really sort of feels like it, it has a presence in our mythology and folklore. Certainly, it certainly does to me. I saw a story not too long ago of several locations, one of them uh, uh, being Japan, where they discovered these stones high up in the hills that basically said the flood made it up this far. I'm, you know, Mm. (laughs) colonizing it a little bit. Mm. But you've seen that in a number of locations where people discovered these, these old carvings saying, you know, water reached here at such and such time. Yeah, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a few sites around the world that indicate some kind of flooding in very high places. I think there are some in Peru as well, and a similar kind of thing where the, something catastrophic has happened that seems to involve water in places that, you know, to us now, we think, well, that can't be, that can't be possible. Um, and obviously some of these uh, ideas of, of, of ancient sort of pre-Ice Age civilizations um, are, are disputed and uh, sort of very controversial in archaeological circles. But we know that there, are, there, are, there, there was something happening at that time. There's just absolutely no way that the, the, there's, there were masses of people experiencing these catastrophic things. And we know that the, some of these floods was, was serious. There was, um, for example, Britain was turned into an island by one called the Sterega Slide, which happened off the coast of a sort of a submarine landslip off the coast of Norway, created this astonishing tsunami that that severed britain from from europe forever it was the the first brexit and uh that 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 must have been traumatic you know that that wiped out a huge area of a place called doggerland which stretched between britain and the north of europe which must have been uh, most people now say that it wasn't it wasn't just some crossing way it was a it was a heartland of of that part of the world at that time and all those lands lands would have gone along with their their kind of their gods and their stories and their everything that they created that they knew was home would, would have been lost and that must have been a deep deep experience and we know that for example, in uh, in Australia, a guy called a geoscientist called Patrick Nunn has kind of mapped out a lot of the mythology in the uh, Aboriginal Australian Dreamtime, which is effectively a sort of library of oral law. And he's worked out that some of the the places that would have been above water when they're talking, but in this in the stories they're talking about, would have been about forty or thirty or forty thousand years ago. It's an incredible amount of time for a piece of oral law to survive. It just shows you the the resilience and the power of that kind of storytelling and to uh, the the myth myth making and i feel that if that was the case and we can track that in modern day australia then surely that must have had the same kind of effect in north america and northern europe well you also have there are stories in uh, great britain of like uh, a high brazil which uh, i noticed in your book you you wrote that you had never heard about uh, before uh, you started doing your research. No, no, it's which is you know there was bits of there was a lot missing in my in my own uh, knowledge, I guess, because I kind of started off with a, quite a simplistic view of of floods. I kind of I've got a sunken forest near where I live, so this is where it all began. So where I live in Hastings, famous for the famous battle uh, where the French invaded. So this uh, just across from our town, there's a, a big stretch of flatland. When I first moved down here about uh, twelve years ago. At low tide, I noticed there was all these trees just sort of emerging from the sand, tree trunks. It's just like someone's just sort of tossed logs everywhere. And there's a few trunks sort of emerging, all sort of pockmarked and 
eroded by the sea in big clumps of peat. And that fascinated me. And I learned that this was a partly Neolithic and partly Mesolithic um, forest. So that was where I suddenly realised that there was this sort of submerged perimeter shelf of lost memories and lost cultures and lost places around Britain. And, and, and they've, they've been finding lots of them all the time. Uh, and so, yeah, that was where the voyage began. I kind of was learning as I went because I knew some of the famous um, uh, British um, flood myths. So there's uh, Leoness, which is the, the sunken Cornish uh, land, which sort of stretched out towards the Isles of Scilly, just where Britain goes towards the Atlantic. And that was this famous submerged place. And there was the Lowland Hundred in the west of Wales, which is another sort of ancient kingdom that was submerged. And so I knew those, but I realised there was lots more. And there were lots more of these sunken forests. They were called, a guy called Clement Reed first discovered them or talked about them in the 1920s. And he called them Noah's forests. Um, and I, then as I started travelling out across other places, I realised these were this is a common phenomenon. And whilst we don't have all the kind of folklore attached to all of those places for me it's, it's quite uh, powerful to sort of start to imagine to try and connect with those lost cultures even if we don't have the stories specifically in those places when it comes to lost cultures of course the most popular i guess would be atlantis yeah some suggesting it was submerged in some kind of cataclysm ages and ages ago what's your perception of that so in my new book, Sunken Lands, I do a chapter devoted to it because I thought it was such an interesting idea and sort of such a contentious one that I, I thought it deserved its own chapter. So while the rest of the book I'm exploring real places, um, this one, that chapter, I thought I'd explore what I called the, the shifting sort of mytho mytho geography of this imaginary place that may have been a real place. And what it the, the bones of the facts are that Plato described a uh, in his um writings Timaeus, he described that uh, Solon uh, goes to Egypt where he meets a priest and the priest says, you don't realize that humankind is a lot older than you imagine. There have been many losses, many civilizations that have gone long before memory. And one of them was Atlantis, which was at war with Athens. Um, and it was about, I think they say it's 6,000 years before, uh, which puts it sort of in that kind of post ice age, Holocene 9,000 BC kind of period. Um, where these huge cataclysms happened and that's that's the kind of story now plato suggested it was real but that's been con you know uh, argued about um, ever since but then it kind of keeps resurging this sort of atlantis idea resurged in the sort of 16th 17th centuries um during the colonial period where people were kind of in search for it and it's resurged in kind of sort of pernicious ways uh, for example in the 20th century the nazis were obsessed with atlantis before we become too obsessed Ooh. with atlantis mm -hmm. we'll try again in the next segment gareth Reese, okay. Gene steinberg Tim Swartz, you're in the Paracast. At First Things First, our mission is early childhood, and it's more important to our state than ever. By focusing on the early years, we help Arizona's children reach their full potential. Quality early learning impacts more than the individual child. Schools benefit from more prepared students, businesses with more qualified employees, and communities with engaged citizens. Investments made in the early years today last for decades. Join the First Things First mission and learn more at azchildhoods.com. At LASIK Plus, we know LASIK is a big decision, and every one of our patients is unique. That's why we customize your LASIK journey to you. I only have a certain budget. No problem. Right now at LASIK Plus, get $1,000 off LASIK when treated in May. That's $500 off per eye, plus guaranteed financing options. So visit MyLASIKOffer.com today to start your journey towards 2020 vision. Must mention this promotion and be treated in May of 2024 to qualify. $1,000 off standard price of Wavelight procedure. $500 off for one eye. Cannot be combined with any other offers. Go to MyLASIKOffer.com for details. This is Jacques Vallée. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Now, you said the Nazis were obsessed with Atlantis. How so? So there was an idea that this came from a lot of occult writings in the 19th century, like um, the theosophist Madame Blavatsky, who wrote about there were these sort of cycles of, of root races that happened in the past. And a lot of these interpretations, a bit like Nietzsche's writing, kind of got taken on by the Nazis to mean that there was a superior culture that existed before everything else and that was responsible for all what we call the you know all the kind of african cultures and south american cultures the behind it was this master race this kind of aryan race that's not what blavatsky meant but that's what the the nazis took from it 
they were interested in the occult, as we know, and Himmler became interested in the idea that we they could find the sort of the, the relatives of the descendants of this sort of Aryan Atlantis, this superior ancient race. They surmised, like Madame Blavatsky had suggested, that they were adepts living in the mountains of Tibet. And so that's where they went. They basically spent some time sort of measuring people's faces to try and ascertain their racial origins. And and even to this day, one of the one of the problems with people talking about uh, superior ancient civilization or advanced civilization that seeded ancient Egypt and other cultures around the world is that some people can take that to mean that there was some kind of it was like non-indigenous and that it was therefore those people not responsible for their advances in maths and architecture it was someone else and while it may be true that there was there was information that was passed down from the ice age it can be a bit controversial so some people seem to take this information and, and use it in I would say dark ways which doesn't then necessarily mean we can't explore it and we can't talk about it because it doesn't mean that, that, that it's not true that there wasn't some kind of cataclysm and that there wasn't some kind of ancient civilization that disappeared. There's lots of places around the world where, for example, around Indonesia, there's a shelf, the Sunderland Shelf, it's called, which is a huge, vast area that would have been heavily populated at that time, it all disappeared. And lots of other spots as well. So some people think that Canary Islands and the Azores are the tips of the mountains of what used to be that land. There's also uh, speculation of the areas around Cuba as well. In a way, Atlantis is, is kind of a good way of mapping out all these major sunken lands around the world. If you see a newspaper story about uh, archaeologists discovering a, a sunken place, they will usually say such and such Atlantis found in this place. They, they use it as a kind of coder, as a kind of a shorthand, I guess, for lost civilizations. What does Gareth Reese think about these lost civilizations? Was there, as far as you're concerned, an Atlantis? My view is that there were important trading posts. And I think that the Stone Age, as we'd call it, was much more sophisticated than people have assumed. And that there seems to be evidence coming out all, all, all the time that there's big temple structures that go way back, uh, like Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, that seem to be around 11,000, 10,000, 9,000 BC. Huge structures that are kind of a bit anomalous with hunter-gatherer communities. And I think that these sophisticated cultures experience things and passed it down in oral law. And I think they, they were, there's evidence, for example, that people that were trading huge distances. They found a sunken place near the Isle of Wight in the English Channel that's like eight, seven or 8,000 years old. That's one of the oldest boat building facilities ever found in Britain. There's lots of these places that are now underwater that were at the time kind of important coastal areas. So I do believe that knowledge was lost. And I do believe that sophisticated societies who were trading, sharing stories and knowledge lost a lot of their land and their culture and their their place and their people and their gods and and I would imagine they would have passed that down in oral law. I seem to remember, and I think it was the Azores, that when the first Europeans got there, the original inhabitants, first of all, were surprised because they thought that they were the only people left in the world, and they had legends that the the Azores had been a lot bigger at one point. But then the sea claimed it, and it was just the tips of the mountains that was remaining. Yeah, the, I think the, the extent of the of the the lands lost is is enormous, and there there are huge there are huge places of importance that would have disappeared. I think there's we if if you look at some of the maps and it says right this is what it would have been like ten thousand years ago, fifteen thousand years ago, it becomes quite extreme how the difference between the the world as we know it now and the world that would have existed then. And as we know, most civilizations or most most um, uh, development happens on coastal areas that's where we kind of that's where humans tend to live and river valleys as well and so that's where most people in the world live today and it's where most of the people would have lived then and if all these places are far far below water then we would have lost a lost a lot more than maybe we imagine well we like to think of ourselves as you know being this technologically advanced society yet Floods are still predominant. They're still a problem. You know, the same we get the same stories today as we got a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, look at um, what well, uh, Dubai just a couple of weeks ago with the you know huge amounts of rain and and flooding in a place that doesn't normally see that. It's still going on today. It, well, it's, ha it's happening in sort of extreme weather events, these sort of once in every hundred year events, once in every 10 year events are happening, you know, every, every year. So even where I live uh, in Hastings, there's flooding that um, happens now every year that was was very rare. There, there, there are lots of places, lots of major cities in danger of um, 
of sinking. Uh, I think they're already planning now to move Jakarta in Indonesia. Uh, and a lot of the what I was interested in was thinking about the experiences of people living in coastal cities now and then thinking about what some of the, the flood stories tell us. So a lot of the certainly the, the, the British ones have a kind of idea of um, and, and the one East, which is the, the legend of the Brittany legend from France. They, they seem to have this kind of moral framing and kind of that we build walls and we build sluice gates and we build these structures and we deny the ebb and flow of nature at our peril. And in a way, what, one of the problems we have is we don't we don't build and construct our uh, urban landscapes in adherence to the kind of the natural flux of things. And we keep sort of eradicating wetlands and we keep cutting down these places that are, natu at are natural bulwarks. And we create straightened canals and straightened waterways that act as conduits for floods. And we build on floodplains and we, we take away the natural protections. And we kind of continue to do that, even though we have the scientific knowledge to not do that and to try and adapt to a changing world, which is marked by transience, you know, which is the nothing ever stays the same, yet we kind of build as if we have this civilization that must stay like this forever. And we, we seem to be very resistant to letting things go and adapting. Are we being well, naive to expect our civilization is just going to last forever? My personal view is absolutely yes, and the the cycles of civilizations, past and present, you know, in the past, going to the deep past. I think that they just tell us that there is a kind of rise and fall. I was interested. One of the chapters in Sunken Lands is about um, Rome, so I went to a place called Baia, which is in the Bay of Naples, and it was the hot spot party town for Romans. It was where anything goes. Place where everyone let their hair down. And it was notorious, a notorious spot. And it must have felt like at that time when the emperors were hanging out there, this incredible place, looking across at this mountain called Vesuvius, which was you know, full of farms and they thought was a safe, lovely mountain that gave them all this kind of excellent farming and produce. The idea that they, they would have, I think the idea they would have had that they were going to exist forever. I mean, they were around, this civilization was around a lot longer than ours at that point. And then suddenly you get um, the explosion of Vesuvius. And then what happened in the hundreds of years after was that, but Bayer itself, this incredible town, uh, sank beneath the waves because of uh, Brady Sizem, which is a, a volcanic activity where the magma chamber underneath empties out. And so the whole place sank. So I managed to go and dive over the ruins because the same phenomenon is allowing the magma chamber to fill again, which is bringing the ruins back towards the surface. And it was fascinating to go to sort of swim over this ancient civilization that must have felt like it was absolutely the pinnacle of everything. You know, it had it all. Uh, and it was very similar to ours today. It was very sort of pragmatic and it was about trade and expansion. Uh, and it, again, it must have seemed like that would last forever. Well, you also wonder, too, if something happened to our civilization, what would be left for our successors, if there are any, to determine that we existed at all? There are some arguments in that, that say civilizations don't really die or disappear. Like the Roman Empire never really died and disappeared. It kind of changed and it can exist. It, it still exists in its own way. And the same as dinosaurs didn't die out. They exist as birds. And so in some ways, there's if you want to look at it in a positive way, nothing really dies. It just changes. And we kind of have everything just moves into a new into a new zone. So what will survive in the future will be what, what the, the parts that are now that just, I don't know, that survive for whatever through chance or through passing on stories. So there will be always be something of us as long as there's a human civilization left to do that. You know, if we annihilate ourselves, then maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Gareth, Gene, Tim, you're in the Paracast. <laughs> At First Things First, our mission is early childhood, and it's more important to our state than ever. By focusing on the early years, we help Arizona's children reach their full potential. Quality early learning impacts more than the individual child. Schools benefit from more prepared students, businesses with more qualified employees, and communities with engaged citizens. Investments made in the early years today last for decades. Join the First Things First mission and learn more at azchildhoods.com. It's time for today's Lucky Land Horoscope with Victoria Cash. Life's gotten mundane, so shake up the daily routine and be adventurous with a trip to Lucky Land. You know what they say, your chance to win starts with a spin. So go to LuckyLandSlots.com to play over 100 social casino-style games for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Get lucky today 
at LuckyLandSlots.com. Available to players in the U.S., excluding Washington and Michigan. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. Hi, this is Bryce Abel. I'm the producer of Dark Skies, the co-author of AD After Disclosure, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So, so far, if there was an Atlantis, it had a human population. After whatever happened, our civilization arose again. How far advanced do you think Atlantis might have been if it existed? There was an interesting guy who lived in Virginia Beach called Edgar Case, who in the 19, I think it was 1920s, he was known as the sleeping prophet. And he would go into these trances and he would, while he's in this sort of, sort of half sleep state, he would go on these journeys into the universal consciousness. And one of the things that he did was he would travel to Atlantis where he described, he described it in quite intricate detail. Yeah, it's Edgar Casey. Oh, and Casey. they also called him the psychic doctor. Right. So he describes Atlantis as having these sort of uh, elephant skin balloons and uh, transport that could go uh, in the air and also travel down through the sea. And so he had this kind of, I think the technology was harnessing the sun. It was using some kind of sun radiation to heat chambers and have hot canals and hot water and things like that. That's, I think that's one of the ideas of, of, of the, of the, the uh, technology they had. It wasn't necessarily, because obviously we live in a petroleum-based civilization and we always tend to assume that any civilization that had advanced technology, it would be a petroleum-based one where we harness the kind of the trapped energy of the sun from beneath the crust of the earth. Whereas, you know, there are possibilities that there are other ways of of harnessing energy or of, of, of moving around and locomotion so yeah it could be interesting to know that people say what's the evidence for a lost civilization with high technology you'll say well it depends what you call high technology it may look to us like magic so it may not have left the same sort of traces as as we'd expect to find there are parts in your book where you talk about um reservoirs with the church steeples still sticking out of them. And it got, it, it, it got me thinking, the area where I live in, here in southern Indiana, we have the exact same thing happened here with a v- reservoir that was <laughs> built in the 1960s. And, of course, the river valley that this reservoir was constructed, there were several towns, one of them including a fairly big church. And, of course, the stories go that at, certain times you can still hear the bell in the church Mm. ringing from underneath the water and not too long ago a couple years ago there was a drought in the area and uh, 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 parts of this church actually came back out from under the water again so again here are similar stories from all across the world uh, that's you, I'll bring this up quite a bit you know, throughout the show because that, that's always a fascinating aspect to all these uh, uh, different types of stories that we'll be talking about is the universal appeal of them. Uh, it's, I find that really fascinating because the, uh, the number of times you hear the bells ringing between the sea, it, it, it seems to cross all through all of the stories and mm. kind of unite them as a, as a motif. I wonder if it's an, an archetypal storytelling device like it's something to do with the way that we that humans tell stories or whether there's some kind of big or it's just that transmission of folklore across the world that ends up having this as as some kind of uh, motif the same motif but i did find that that fascinating i was when i was uh, a little kid i wrote a novel when i was seven called travel to the underwater palace and i had a image in the front of the book and then in and then in the story it's a spire sticking out of the sea that's to represent mm. this underwater palace and it was not i didn't I hadn't seen any of these myriad uh, images of churches sticking out over the water as far as i'm aware and i was again i was wondering is there some kind of a storytelling archetype some kind of way that we mythologize places particularly sunken places that that that, that replicates itself I don't know. That's uh, uh that's that's an interesting thought and it uh, it, uh, I mean, I mean, I'm sure that it has a lot to do with, because everywhere has ha- has has had a town or a village inundated at one time or another, and people have to flee, and leave everything behind. So then, as it gets passed down, I think you know from uh, uh, oral traditions, it does become 
you know, almost like an archetype. You know, that see that lake there? You know, the church is there. <laughs> yeah, it was I was I traveled around in Wales and I find that fascinating because I'm half Welsh, but I I didn't realize it was so saturated in flood law. And and every single lake had a sunken place at the bottom of it. I mean, every single one. And some one of one of the theories about that um, is that a lot of people, lake dwelling peoples, um, lived on things called crannogs, which were these floating islands communities in the middle of lakes that would, that, would, that would exist. And it could have been the experience of people actually living on these lakes that created these mythologies. There's also evidence of kind of other periods of climate change. We talk about the kind of the great kind of arc of climate change, the growth, the warming and the Holocene, but there are other kind of period, periodic shifts. One of them was at the end of the Bronze Age, there was a, 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 dry, a, dry, a dry period that then became extremely wet and where maybe certain bodies of water dried out, like we have some, with some of these reservoir places that dry out, and then suddenly flooded quite quickly as the rains returned which would have again seemed quite traumatic if people hadn't really connected with the deeper history of that or understood what was happening so it could have been that these sorts of events fed into this sort of folklore and then they become stories that we then tell later on so in the medieval period and then and then that kind of a folklore boom of the 18th and 19th century where these stories get updated and new new elements get added to them but they all come from maybe this sort of deep kind of mysterious experience of things that flood and things that appear and disappear um there's a lot of evidence for example in some of the places that have had that flooding at the end of the bronze age of swords being thrown into the water uh, to kind of appease the gods uh, this is quite a common thing, particularly in Lincolnshire and England and places like that, where they've they've found a lot of these accumulations of trinkets in bodies of water that would have been at the kind of the edge of where these things happened, these sort of flood events happened. When it comes to folklore, how can you determine whether any of it has any accuracy at all? It goes from one person to another person, and we argue over what happened one hour ago. Mm-hmm. My, um, I'm really interested in the subjective experience, I suppose, and 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 storytelling. And in a way, I'm storytelling too. And I, I see myself as a folklorist, not one that kind of tries to create, recreate old stories that have gone. But I'm kind of taking old old stories and things that have been passed down, and I'm in that conversation as well. And so I'm never necessarily trying to ascertain the absolutely factual. Uh, connections between all these things though there are some people who are doing that so like i say patrick nunn uh, is is, a, is one who's doing that a lot really trying to trace these folk laws and try just seeing what elements are true and using kind of uh, science to to ascertain it my my I, as a writer i'm a i'm a kind of a, a, a travel writer really i suppose or a sort of someone who's tracing a path through the sort of subjective landscapes and feeling this kind of ongoing story that I do think, yeah, changes all the time. For example, most of the flood stories that we know of have been kind of updated so many times that they've got anachronistic features. So a lot of the ones like the East one in Brittany and France, the Lowland Hundred in Wales and a lioness have these kind of strange gates and walls that wouldn't have been sort of in the Mesolithic and neither would they have been in the kind of Anglo-Saxon period where, they, where they're supposed to have happened. They, they were updated because in Britain we had these um, the Dutch came over in the 1700s and started draining an area called the Fens using all these amazing technologies, so sort of pumps and, and floodgates and sluice gates. And those entered the folklore and became the kind of stories we tell today about the gates being left open by drunken gatekeepers and water flowing in. So, yeah, it's completely dissociated from what it, whatever that core base experience is of a, a flooded sort of uh, hunting ground in the Mesolithic has become this sort of moral tale of drunkenness and technological overreach in the, in this, in the 1800s and 1900s. It makes for a good story to tell. I just love stories. I love telling stories, and, I, and I, stories excite me about places. And, and the kind of the, the sort of the stranger uh, they are, the, the better for me. The more sort of interesting they are. But doesn't knowing the facts, if you can get them, maybe that's even a more fascinating adventure. It is, and I think that's why Sunken Lands, particularly, um, that is a book where I've probably more than any of the other books I've done, I've really looked at you know, the science and looked at the geography of these places and incorporated that into my into my storytelling, um, into my non-fictional storytelling. Whereas in a book that I did, uh, like uh, one I did one about sort of retail uh, car lot spaces and parking garages, I'm kind of just traveling through it and finding my own resonances and weirdness, connecting up bits of graffiti and strange bits of litter and, uh, and seepage of, of, of history into these sort of concrete spaces. Um, they're kind of more subjective and improvisational. But for Sunker Lands, oh, yeah, I was very keen to connect it to because I wanted to tell a story about where we are now, about about kind of global warming and, and extreme weather events and some of the precariousnesses of our of our civilization today. 
Okay, Gareth Moore, yeah. with you, my friend, and Gene and Tim, you're in the Pettycast. <laughs> At First Things First, our mission is early childhood, and it's more important to our state than ever. By focusing on the early years, we help Arizona's children reach their full potential. Quality early learning impacts more than the individual child. Schools benefit from more prepared students, businesses with more qualified employees, and communities with engaged citizens. Investments made in the early years today last for decades. Join the First Things First mission and learn more at azchildhoods.com. Step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you want to get mixed up in the family business. Introducing The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of The Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play The Godfather now at ChompaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Oh, all this stuff is fascinating. Going under the water... And some people think with global warming, and I know there's a lot of dispute over that, but let's just go with the mainstream science for the time being. And that is, we could be underwater eventually because sea levels are rising. Yes. And so it's interesting to know what that, what a kind of effect that would have and also what, what, would, what would remain of us. I suppose one of the reasons I was writing that, this book was to, was to think about what, what remains of us, what remains of our experiences uh, and our culture when huge rapid change happens. Because whether people can argue about the, the science behind climate change or, or they like, the fact is there are, the floods are happening. Places are sinking underwater, not just because of global warming, but because of the, we, uh, we extract the water from underneath cities, the weight and impact of buildings, isostatic shifts. Still, we're still haunted by the end of the ice age because the, the retreat of that ice is still affecting how places tilt and how much affected they are by, um, by sea rise. So all those things are just they're, they're 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 happening to us now. So it's an it's a story that's happening around us now. But scientists get very frustrated because when they sort of pass on data and and it doesn't really have an effect. So my view is that maybe we need sort of more stories. We need storytelling. There's a sort of place for writers and artists to to help. I think I think we need better stories and more stories about what's happening. And there are interesting ideas about you know when floods happen, what's going to happen. There's a guy called David Farrier who wrote a book called Footprints, Future Fossils. And he sort of describes what will remain. And one of the interesting things is those sort of coastal flooded places that are flooding are most likely to become fossilized and enshrined for the future. They're the places that will become the kind of the fossil hotspots of the kind of the deep, the deep future, if we call it that. What do you think the, uh, the myths and legends will be after global warming takes us out? I mean, we know that uh, from the past, the stories that arise from even localized events, but we're talking about something that will affect humans worldwide. So the survivors, years from now, what would they talk about? I, I guess that's something that we that we'll never know. Um, in my writing, because I like to use a bit of sort of speculation, I kind of I do a little bit I do a little bit like that. I talk about how uh, I look out across this North Walesian beach and I see these sort of oil rigs and um, and wind turbines sort of battling out for renewable energy and the old energy. And I imagine there's a kind of the story being told about the, the clash between the barons, the oil barons and the renewable people uh, and the fact that, you know, maybe those are the ruins that we'd find fossilized under the sea. And we talk about some clash and perhaps like Atlantis and a lot of the other stories, well, there'll, there'll be myths of overreach. The idea that we kind of reached too far. We, we were too arrogant. We took too much out of the land. We used up too much resources and we didn't build in a way that was um, in harmony with the biosphere. And, and that's what was our the kind of the hubris, I guess, or the, the reason for our downfall. So Mother Nature gets its revenge. I think so, yeah. <laughs> well, you can't stop the waters. No. In fact, that's, that's what uh, one of the, um, the people from Aldi Jean Charles said in the uh, Louisiana wetlands, which is this um, 
place I visited that's effectively abandoned now. I think there's a couple of ha- people uh, inhabited houses left, but they're the, uh, the United States' first um, climate change refugees, and they've been all sort of relocated. And there's a film. Uh, called don't stop the water in which uh, one of the residents just says the water's going to come you can't stop it and there's that kind of acceptance that's what there's a guy called michael o'dowd who's who who writes about this he's a um it's called a climate change advocate i think or post grief advocate he taught he calls it a post doom mentality it's like an acceptance that something's happening and there's these changes happening and a willingness to adapt and change because you can't stop the water and no matter how many walls you build and how many sluice gates you build the kind of the lesson seems to be that at some point those are going to crumble they're going to become so expensive um that they're not going to be sustainable which is what's the situation facing a lot of places on the coast at the moment but people still insist on building and living in these flood pl- flood prone areas and then have the nerve to look surprised when they get flooded <laughs> it is it is strange isn't it and again perhaps because developers put these things there and then people buy thinking assuming that the developers have got it all sort of sorted out <laughs> and they know what's going on this kind of mm. confidence that we again this idea that we have we lay down sort of asphalt and concrete and it's that's it that's permanent that's really solid and we're going to be okay not realizing we live on these kind of shifting sands all the time um so there's a huge amounts of in, in in the states and across europe um of, of people's yeah continuing to build the floodplains um despite the evidence that it's not going to work and despite the problems they shore up for themselves here in hastings we had a landslip recently uh, again it's a place where this river it runs down from the hills and the people around there are complaining to the council that they weren't, didn't invest enough but the, the thing is it's, it's at some point that water is going to come down and that, that, that stuff's going to become saturated with extreme rainfall and really they can complain about it but ultimately that's the problem the problem is that though that area of land is going to change and crumble that's what it would have done if we hadn't built on it and trying to hold back the waters you know like samson holding the pillars you know it's just not going to work uh there were there were some states, and I can't remember which ones now, uh, southern states on the East Coast here in the United States that actually passed laws a few years back uh, uh, forbidding the discussion of climate change and how they were going, how it was going to affect the shorelines. It was like, you know, we'll pass these laws and ignore the evidence so we can continue building and making money. And oh, we got flooded. Sorry. Yeah, I, 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 I can only. But just just a short ter- a short termism, just a, just a, a kind of instant greed that like we need to we need to, I can't accept this long term view. So I will just make the money we can do now, and then and then I guess someone else will take responsibility for it later on. It's the only <laughs> thing I can imagine that 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 philosophy. It's the same as it's the same as um, um, oil companies who, who who kind of ignored a lot of their own research into the effects of what they were doing, um, and I guess they were just going well. It, it's uh, we, it's something for a future generation. But the thing is, those fu- those futures coming up a lot quicker than I think people can imagine when when you were doing your research uh, uh for sunken lands and and i know that a lot of it had to do more with um you know like natural events things like that yeah. but i mean did, did you run across any evidence from the past on how um just kind of that same uh, uh narrow think going on that that we're experiencing today that you know, build you know, build your houses. We'll live here, and oh, we got flooded. Too bad. <laughs> I that's it's it's interesting because I think that maybe there was more of a a, a transience. I know that. Uh, let's say let's look at I don't know let's say to Rome for example Rome mm-hmm. was really affected by floods which I didn't realize and there wasn't much, there wasn't much writing about it but I read a book uh, by a guy called Professor Aldretti called Floods uh, of the Ancient Tiber and Ancient Rome, and he says that Rome flooded all the time to the point that just this catastrophic things happening, just people being carried off through the waters. And they kind of, uh, rather than worrying about the infrastructure, just used to take these omens and use it to sort of influence their general policies of whether they should attack Gaul. In fact, you know, sometimes if there was a flood, rather than do anything about it infrastructurally, they would just like bury a Gaul under some mud or something like that. So it, it's an interesting, they had different philosophical views of what happens when something happens. They go, well, that's just happening now. And so we just build ourselves of society around it um, but mm. certainly it was definitely affecting like a, a civilization like Rome where they built they, it was built on the hills but then they went into the floodplain so they had made exactly the same mistake in the ancient world um, but just took it with that kind of weird stoic Roman 
outlook, I guess. Um, <laughs> and, and and so that was their way of doing it. In terms of like the deeper into deeper into the Mesolithic, I'm imagine that what would have happened is people moved, just moved, because I guess there was a, there were there were fewer sort of they weren't a sort of adhering to stone structures and infrastructures that were so tightly bound up in a kind of ecological system and sorry and an economic system that they all had to cling to whatever cost, which is kind of what the situation we're in. So I, I imagine there was a much more adaptable way of going about things. And I know that now in places like Fiji um they're they're moving villages they're just moving them up 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 high ground uh, like i said the jakarta thing they're going to move that city as well and that could be that could be just what has to happen eventually will be just like all the ancients will just have to move well that would be fun if you are a company that does moving services you know you have all <laughs> yeah. these moving trucks and you could just do it but they can also physically move houses although it's a big pain they can literally do that. We've got Gareth Reese, who explores folklore, the fact and the fiction mythology. So many fascinating things to continue to talk about. I'm Gene Steinberg. He's Tim Swartz. And what that means is you're in The Pericast. <laughs> At First Things First, our mission is early childhood, and it's more important to our state than ever. By focusing on the early years, we help Arizona's children reach their full potential. Quality early learning impacts more than the individual child. Schools benefit from more prepared students, businesses with more qualified employees, and communities with engaged citizens. Investments made in the early years today last for decades. Join the First Things First mission and learn more at azchildhoods.com. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Gareth, I gather the way things are going. Very few people educated in the real world about the nasty consequences going on. In terms of um, global warming and sea level rise? Yes. It does seem that way. I think that the narrative is very much in, in the hands of the, of the media that's kind of interested in sort of maintaining the status quo and not kind of challenging maybe some of the deeper concepts that we have uh, that we build our civilization on. I think if people understood that, maybe they would be more adaptable. I think there's always a fear that uh, that any kind of change or adaptation will result in sort of uh, economic catastrophe for someone. And therefore, then it can't happen. We, we're kind of maybe we've built ourselves into a corner. For example, in the UK, we have a huge problem with um, toxic in our waterways and some sewage coming into the waterways and most of our seas they can't swim in most of our rivers now are polluted and that strangely because it's it's there and it's right on people's doorsteps and people going well i can't swim there i can't fish there i can't go there they're really there's much more of an anger and uh, activity around it than other sort of topics and i think maybe that's that's what's going to happen people will it will start to affect people this i think at one time these were things that were happening farther away and you'd have to read a newspaper article or a book or follow a certain twitter account in order to get that information and understand what's happening but i think now the effects uh, are beginning to seep into people's everyday lives and begin to affect the, their own hometowns or the place they live or people they know and i think that will result in change how fast that change will come i don't know i think people will be educated by the sense that they'll, they'll feel something happening around them they'll see these the, the burgeoning news reports about these events and the amount of people affected that aren't just in places in sort of remote Polynesian islands or they're not just happening into developing countries they're happening to places that are near us you know whether it's you know and strange things like sort of fires in the Siberian tundra or you know what happened up in you know Oregon and Canada fires and in, in the north you know there's that these things are going to start affecting people and, and maybe change people's consciousness about what's happening in a way then that the maybe the media will have to catch up or adapt in order to you know to tell the right story i know for a lot of people it it can be difficult to see how 
this could be affecting them unless you're living in someplace, say, like the Marshall Islands, when mm. I think they're saying that within, you know, 50 years, they're going to be completely underwater. But, uh, you know, like if you're the, uh, say, like the central part of the United States, the idea of climate change and, and the, the coast flooding, you know, like they you know, shrug their shoulders. But these kind of events affect everywhere. Yeah, there's going to be a point where people realize there isn't there isn't escape. There's no over there that you can kind of put all the trash and you can move all the kind of you can sort of offset everything to another place while you continue in the same vein. I think that will become more and more apparent in hopefully enough places to create a tipping point when people understand that it's also there. I mean, I, I wrote Sunken Lands. I hadn't really tackled this subject at all of, of, of sea levels and climate change. It'd been the backdrop of, of some of my stories, but it was uh, it was as the pandemic was happening and I was looking at my children sort of running through pet level through the bones of this Mesolithic forest near where we live and seeing, thinking about cycles of change in the past, what was happening now and this incredible thing that was happening during, during the lockdown, that I, so, I suddenly thought of what they were going to inherit and what my responsibility was for the future. And I guess I felt, I suddenly felt that future happen. I've, it felt rather than this disassociated thing, this thing that was going to happen in some distant sort of mythological future, I felt that was much closer when I saw my children in that situation. I felt the impact of the global events kind of happening to me right in my hometown. It, it felt like the, the world had come to me, these, these events had happened. Just after I finished the book, I came back from New Orleans for the final trip and I set about writing the book and there was a massive flood in our town. My the entire local park where I taught my kids to ride their bikes and stuff was all underwater. Tennis courts. It was like a J.G. Ballard novel. Just tennis courts and little bits of sort of leisure facilities sticking out of these waters. And it really came home to me that sort of the floods had kind of followed me back. And this and this was the story. And it felt more prescient and more like this was the story I really wanted to tell. Well, I hope that that happens to people, but I hope that people begin to see that this is something that affects us all and affects our children, our children's children. And it's it's our legacy. It's what it's our responsibility. It's not someone else's in the future. It's a sobering thought how this will affect your children. I mean, I know that I can tell a difference with the local climate from when I was a kid to now when I'm, you know, in my in my early sixties. And I have a daughter, and and I wonder what what differences is she going to experience from now till. Hopefully she reaches my age and it does somewhat, you know, uh, frighten me. There are interesting little differences, isn't there? I remember driving through France when I was a kid on holiday and uh, we did it every year for about five years. And we would have to, every um, service stop, we'd have to scrape the insects off the window, off the windshield. And I went, I did it recently and there was hardly anything. I didn't have to do that at all. In fact, every time I've driven to Europe, I've, no, I've just noticed a lack of insects. Uh, that's just one of those little details that you suddenly think, what was it like when I was a kid? And, you, and because these things happened, I guess, gradually, maybe if we were to flip back 40 years, then we'd suddenly see this kind of difference. But these little little things that seem like not much, they really, they really build up. You wonder then if that's the kind of rate of loss in the sort of two years since I was a kid, what that's going to be in the sort of 40 years until they're be, until they're, um, was I talking about the windshield? Yes. Yeah. So I, I would scrape these uh, bugs from the windshield uh, in huge amounts. And then now when I drive to France and Spain, there's just nothing. There's just hardly anything hits, hits the windscreen. It, it's a noticeable, tangible difference in the amount of the volume of insects uh, in the garden and when you're driving around. And I'm thinking if that's the rate of change since I was a kid 40 years ago, what's it going to be like in the 40 years until the kids reach my age? Uh, these these are just the sort of slightly subtle differences, little tiny things that have happened. But uh, there's loads of other stuff that's going to change for them. I mean, it's hard for me to speculate, but it, it's it's a frightening idea because the the rate of change seems to be rapid um, and accelerating. I do remember all the time I spent cleaning off the windshield of my car over the years as a result of that problem. Mm. And now, as you say, you hardly see it at all. Yeah, it's it's a shocking it's a shocking thing, really. Um, and and you think, how does that? How do we? Can we go back? It's a you know, are the, how many of these things are reversible? How, what can we do to kind of to sort of not only stem that float, but so to 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 bring things back a bit? There's lots of arguments, for example, for rewilding, restore restoration of wetlands, these insect habitats. There's lots of other things we can do about how we build buildings, how we can create um, gardens, how we can make our uh, buildings habitable for insects rather than trying to kind of remove pests at all costs 
we kind of maybe introduce them into the places we live. There's all sorts of things that we can do. And again, this people get uh, trapped in the, the global warming argument, but there's a lot of stuff just about how we treat our environment and what we do, you know, where we put our toxins and what we what we knock down and what we think we can offset with new forests and these ancient delicate uh, eco structures, uh, ecosystems that um, can't really be broken. When they're broken, they're broken, and they they take thousands of years to return. Uh, and they, they're not just things that we can just do with replanting or, or creating gardens here and there. So. Yeah, I think it's an urgent thing that we we all need to think about, and just just for the sake of, you know, what do we, what kind of world do we want to leave when we're when we're gone? I mean, maybe it's something I just think about when I get older, anyway, regardless of having children. But I feel like the distance between the Mesolithic people of the Holocene undergoing their traumas and the people a thousand years from now, I feel like Brian Eno calls it the long now. This idea that the present is actually a lot wider than just that kind of temporal 10 sort of minutes or hours or days or even years it's actually thousands of years to either side if you begin to see the world in that way you begin to feel much more responsible you feel much more responsible for the future and much more like you're in the same moment and uh, i think that's that psychological trick really helps me um, it makes me see things in a, a much wider sort of lens way well there's a general observation i'll make here is i've lived at this particular location near Phoenix for the past five years or so. And even over those five years, I see fewer insects outside. You know, every so often I'd be buzzed by something walking around. Now it seldom happens, and that's in five years. Yeah. Um, there's, I think I put, I put a little bit at the end of the book where I say, uh, since my second child was born, 160 species of animal have disappeared. 30% of insects have gone. 61 million hectares of forest have been felled. 14 trillion tons of ice have melted. The 10 warmest years in recorded history have occurred in the past 10 years, and the climate has measurably altered. The world is different from what it was a decade ago, and in 10, times, 10 years' time, it will be different again. We'll continue with Gareth, Gene, Tim, you're in. Oh, the Paracast. <laughs> At Cox Mobile, we know you're smart and always looking for the best way to do things, like cutting onions with goggles. <laughs> you also added Cox Mobile. So smart. Now you're running on the network with unbeatable 5G reliability and saving on your Cox Internet. It's ingenious, just like you. Cox Mobile, the smart way to mobile. Cox postpaid internet required. Cox Mobile runs on the network with unbeatable 5G reliability as measured by Ookla LLC in the U.S. 2H 2023. Other restrictions apply. Learn more at cox.com mobile. At First Things First, our mission is early childhood, and it's more important to our state than ever. By focusing on the early years, we help Arizona's children reach their full potential. Quality early learning impacts more than the individual child. Schools benefit from more prepared students, businesses with more qualified employees, and communities with engaged citizens. Investments made in the early years today last for decades. Join the First Things First mission and learn more at azchildhoods.com. This is Micah Hanks of the Gray Alien Report, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We're going into the nasty effects here of the changes in the world, and we can go on with that, except, of course, it can be very depressing. All the yeah. things we had when we were kids, now we don't have, and the areas I grew up in, the climate conditions now can be really nasty. Like here near Phoenix, last year there was a record number of days where the temperature exceeded 100 and the temperature exceeded 110 degrees. And that's just almost unbelievable where we go with that. So I just wonder if we're going to be here 100 years from now. There are some, without getting too gloomy about it, there are some, there are some you know, scientists who have projected the likelihood of, of the collapse of, of our civilization and said it's, it's, it's highly likely to happen in the next sort of, 50 to 100 years. And therefore, what, you know, the world that will be here in 100 years will be radically transformed. What, what remains afterwards is, 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 is 
I guess speculate, speculatory, but it's interesting. And again, I, if we think about these old flood stories and their endurance and their resilience, and maybe there's the stories we tell about ourselves now, what we do now will will last, no matter what happens, no matter what kind of events occur. You know, we all have the capacity for change, and we all have the capacity to do something. It just, if if we had the, some kind of collective notion of that, maybe there would be more left, uh, more of us that survives. That's what gives me hope. Maybe listeners will find that maybe not so hopeful, but for me it does. It's a sort of philosophical way of understanding everything's going to change anyway. I mean, regardless of what's happening to the global climate, things things do change. We shouldn't cling to what is not going to be permanent. I mean, nothing is permanent. And that's one way of kind of letting go of where we are and just allowing maybe our civilization to change with it, because the more we adhere to this kind of rigid view of things, I think the more sort of grief we shore up for ourselves. Well, if ET is really here, as Sam suggests, with UFOs, flying saucers, UAPs, you would think that if they cared at all a whit about us, they'd, they'd do something about it. But obviously, they either do not exist, or they don't care, or they have a prime directive, or they can screw up somebody's life by showing up repeatedly, but they can't do anything, if you get my drift. Yeah, but it's because it's interesting that the, yeah, they seem to be very interested in uh, nuclear facilities. Is that right? Yes. So uh, it could be that, you know, it's because of our propensity to blow each other up that could be the undoing um, that the alien aircraft or whatever they may be are pointing us to and, and not necessarily global warming. Earlier in the program, you talked about uh, scuba diving in the Bay of Naples. And I read that section in your book and found it just just really fascinating. Do you uh, want to talk about that a little more? Uh, give us some more detail because I think our audience would enjoy hearing about uh, your experience. Yes. Yeah, so in the in the Bay of Naples, um, the Bay of Naples is, is effectively the caldera of a supervolcano. So everyone knows about Vesu- Vesuvius, which sort of stands overlooking um, Naples and was famous for the destruction of Pompeii. But the supervolcano in the bay is much much bigger, and the magma chamber leaches out gases and magma and and which kind of creates a sort of sinking effect and then it fills and it rises again so this is an effect that happens of huge huge periods of time so in the roman period this was it was in a, in a stable period so the town they built on the slopes around it it was called there was a few of the towns but one of them was called Bayer. and this town was a party hotspot it was it was it was Las Vegas. It was Ibiza. It was any of these places where people go to let their hair down, where all the richest, most powerful people in Rome and the Roman Empire would come on holiday. It was like Marcus Aurelius, the famous uh, uh, um, uh, philosophical emperor. He uh, went to school there. Um, there was uh, Nero had a house there. Julius Caesar had a villa there. So all the big names and all of their kind of most important generals. And so they would go into these, it was all thermally heated by these springs. They had these bathhouses all kind of arranged on the hill and these kind of lots of roads and oyster farms and facilities. They had the nymphaeums, which are kind of like sort of swimming bath places for entertaining guests. So it was a really bustling place. And they, the, the, the process of radicism happened at the end of the Roman Empire. So as the Roman Empire was crumbling, so too was Bayer slipping beneath the waves. And by the time the kind of the Arabs came and invaded, it was it was sunk well below uh, the sea and it went down and down and down again. It was almost forgotten. Uh, the poet Shelley visited there and saw faint, faint traces of some city beneath the waters uh, and put it into a poem. But ultimately, it kind of became forgotten. But in the 1960s, the same phenomenon began to lift up the uh, town, the remnants of the town from under the water, so that a pilot flying over in the 1960s saw the outline of this Roman town. And that became the archaeological, underwater archaeological park of Bayer. So this is a place where you can go and dive and sort of swim over Roman ruins. So being a non-diver, I thought, well, this is my chance to kind of really get active because most of the book I'm wandering around looking at places that are sort of maybe there, maybe not, maybe never existed at all, a kind of sort of nebulous, strange liminal worlds around around Britain. Um, so what I thought I'd do is get, get my hands dirty and get under the water. So I went there uh, and I've not dived before and being a neurotic uh, middle-aged man, I was kind of terrified really. I had sort of, it has this sort of list of things, what's wrong with you? You know, I'm short, I I'm short of breath and my heart's palpitating a bit, I'm not sure about this. But anyway, over I went, I signed the forms and went down into the water. And it was kind of an incredible experience because at first it's kind of disappointing because it's like nothing but sand and what seems like kelp and a few low walls. But as you go down, you begin to sort of make out the architecture of this old town, the walls and the roads and the architraves. 
And they so they discovered all these Roman statues there that they they did remove for safety, but then they've replaced them in exact spots they were found with replicas. So you're suddenly swimming through these statues uh, of Roman gods and goddesses. Uh, it's an incredible experience, really, as long as you're not, like me, terrified your heart's about to rupture. Um, so I was kind of one eye on the history and like one eye on the, you know, the guide who was ha- holding my hand and taking me through it. But yeah, it was a fascinating thing. And, you know, it's an interesting idea, like swimming in the in the middle of this active super volcano that at the moment, it's right. The reason the whole town's rising is that it's stre- just the, the, the magma chamber is stretching to breaking point, and they do believe that that, that there is a you know, chance it might erupt. So I was, I felt like I was right in the hot heat of, of radical change there. Well, do you think at the end of that diving expedition you felt more relaxed about it that you'll do it again, or have you decided you know what I put up with it and that's it? <laughs> I would, I would possibly do it again. Um, it was it was exhilarating and it was amazing to sort of the to be in that situation where you are diving over the ruins of this ancient civilization that thought it would last forever. It did feel very prescient. It did feel like, you know, like you asked earlier on, you know, what will happen become of us? And I was thinking about the idea that, you know, you know, th- there will be future divers doing exactly the same thing over, you know, over towns and cities that we once had all of our parties and had all these incredible memories and times and they've been reduced to these these ruins. So, yeah, I thought it was exhilarating. And it also, I think what I found was when I kind of burst through the surface, looking up at Vesuvius, thinking I'm in the middle of a super volcano that could blow any day. And I've just looked at the ruins of the civilization. I should probably be kind of maybe depressed or frightened about it, but I felt kind of inspired. I felt that kind of spirit of Marcus Aurelius, that kind of stoic thing, like, you know, time is a stream and, you know, things come and things go and that's the way things are. And we've just got to adapt. And so that's, that was kind of the, I felt I could learn, learn a lesson from the Romans. Well, better you than me. I am not going to dive. I mean, I might be forced to in a flood or something, but I live in an area where we have desert and we do have rain more than we used to, but I don't expect to go into the ocean anytime soon unless I'm forced. I guess it's my uh, living in an island, uh, you know, Britain, it's we're kind of the seafaring nation. So I feel it's like my duty, no matter how terrified I am about it. Uh, my uncle was a diver and used to dive for, uh, for, for wrecks off the coast of Scotland, which is a very dark, cold sea indeed. I mean, not for the faint hearted. Uh, so I felt like I, I couldn't let my family down, really. I had to give it a go. I thought if I, if I did perish in the waters of Bayer, think of the posthumous book, book sales. You know, that's what I had to think about. So what would happen there is your family would be enriched by your absence. Absolutely. Well, that's encouraging, at least. You know, it's cheaper <laughs> than life insurance. <laughs> I don't know how insurance works in the UK. So I'm just guessing because here you have all these companies, you can get life insurance for this amount of money. And then you apply and it's twice as much. <laughs> yeah. And also we have to think about, you know, even a really successful book is, I don't know if it's going to keep them um, that long and that rich, but, uh, you know, it would have been a legacy at least. Well, think of it. Imagine if you were someone like Michael Connolly, who created the Lincoln lawyer and Bosch. Well, then of course he's raking it in the rest <laughs> of us who write books and I've written books, hmm, yeah. not so much. Gareth Reese, Gene Steinberg, Tim Swartz, you're in. The Paracast. At First Things First, our mission is early childhood, and it's more important to our state than ever. By focusing on the early years, we help Arizona's children reach their full potential. Quality early learning impacts more than the individual child. Schools benefit from more prepared students, businesses with more qualified employees, and communities with engaged citizens. Investments made in the early years today last for decades. Join the First Things First mission and learn more at azchildhoods.com. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW group. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. This is Big the Merciless. 
You are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio, exactly according to my plan. I guess we're exploring to some degree here the fate of our civilization where things may go for us, but I want to just cover the legends of ancient civilizations before we get into more folkloric things, Mm -hmm. and that is... Is there any way we can ever get the truth behind legends like Atlantis? Don't think so. I think what we can do is we can trace, and I think this is happening, we can increasingly understand more of what has been lost. And there seems to be sort of incredible discoveries happening all the time of of structures that are a lot older than we imagine that seem to be from Stone Age societies that had much more um, going for them in terms of uh, in terms of how they the civilization what they built and how they were organized and possibly that you know whatever their mythological structures were or their knowledge of the stars i think that is pushing us towards what we can imagine atlantis was if we think of atlantis as a representation of knowledge and sophistication that has been lost i think yes i think we can find more of that i don't think anyone will ever pinpoint it because we as, you know it could be that the plato did make it up or that he based it on sort of uh, stories from stories and stories that were told to him. And the, and the truth is so far gone that you can't ever pinpoint it. Could be more of what we'll find is just this deep experience of floods and change in our in our kind of ancient history that, that have resonance for us now. What I'm interested in when I tell these, when I think about ancient stories, is not necessarily what happened then, but it's what's happening now. And that's what makes them come alive and what connects them to the things that are happening around us today. And you wonder too, if these legends are correct how far advanced were these people could they have been advanced in terms of what we're at could they have had flying ships etc how much would survive how much of us would survive way after a world catastrophe my reading about this is surprisingly little and it's amazing how quickly things dissolve in there's an argument that what will be left of us will be chicken bones and a ring of plastic which if you took some future archaeologists, a paleontologist coming down from outer space or from a future civilization, they might come to completely the wrong conclusions about that. I quite like the idea that, particularly when I was writing about um, the mythology of our structures like sort of motorways and, and service stations and, and, and different cities, sort of urban structures, what, what people would make when they become like our Neolithic ruins, when they become a series of low walls, you know, will, will certain things look like ancient ceremonial causeways when really they were just you know routes to different cities and like what what, what, how do we interpret the past and how much of it when we interpret these sort of series of low walls and little sort of flecks and tiny traces and we paint these amazing pictures of it how much of it is ever as true and how much is it really a story about the people who are looking at it long and short we'll never know long and short is our successors if there are any we'll never know They'll never know. They'll, 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 they'll come up with their own narrative from what fragments we left behind, potentially. There are arguments that there's, well, there was a Hungarian semiotician who, because one of the things about our current situation is we have all these nuclear uh, sites uh, that are going to remain toxic for a long, long time. And if our civilization crumbled, there would be, and there, there would be no traces of any kind of information about these places. They'd be so toxic that they would destroy anyone who tried to mess with them. And in the 1980s, there was a Hungarian linguist, Thomas, I can't know if I got the pronunciation right, but Sebiok, and he proposed formulating a folklore, kind of cautionary folklore, to deter people from meddling with toxic waste story sites. And he thought that the most enduring things today are these religious institutions and kind of grand old sort of creation myths. So he thought an atomic priesthood might be able to sort of preserve some of our messages about uh, toxic nuclear sites far into the future, even when civilizations have sort of risen and fallen and crumbled. I don't know if that's a very optimistic view of, of, of how oral law can survive, but certainly traces of it have survived for thousands of years, certainly, like I said before, in Australia. Here there be dragons. Mm. There's also sculptures. People are, I think there's commissions going for people to create the most gnarly, enduring sculptures to place in the sites that we don't want you know, any future civilizations, either human or otherwise, to kind of meddle with. It's how do we how do we communicate with the deep future without using our cultural symbols and, and assumptions? I don't know. I think the atomic priesthood, you know, that uh, I think that has a better chance of surviving over the eons, over you know sculptures or you know maybe carvings in living rock, but mm. uh, the you know oral traditions uh, do seem to persist. It does seem to be the case. I think that was definitely his his line of thinking. But then again, there will always be people 
who will ignore that <laughs> and then go and uh, uh, mess around where they shouldn't be messing around. I think so. Curiosity would get the better of people. I also think it's kind of so random if you think about what what is left I don't know, from, let's say, the Cretaceous period of which bits of dinosaurs, a dinosaur that happened to be in a certain place at a certain specific time with a very, very specific set of circumstances that allowed them, this sort of corpse to be buried in a certain way that preserved it. And I think that it's the tiny, tiny fragments that survive into the future and they're kind of random or at least there's no way of predicting or controlling that. Well, we still have time in the program. I'd love to talk about uh, one of your other books, the uh, 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 Unofficial Britain. Yep. And uh, I, I absolutely enjoyed this book because you just, I mean, you get into subjects in such a way that are really surprising. And I mean, like the, uh, 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 what would it be, the very first uh was it the first chapter or, or somewhere along in there? Well, in the first chapter, uh, um, the strange religion of uh, electricity pylons. Mm. Now, you know, I mean, that's that's something that everybody sees every day all over the place. And, you know, the way that you write about these things, it's just, you know, beautiful, first of all, uh, and, and, and uh, 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 just just very well written. Oh, thank you. I was obsessed with pylons as a kid. I, 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 I thought they'd always been there. They seemed like these incredibly beautiful, slightly terrifying, menacing structures on the on the hillsides. And they seemed like alien invaders as a kid with who loved sort of science fiction. Uh, I just really... I really found them fascinating. I was more interested in pylons than I was in, I don't know, oak trees. Uh, I had this kind of a thing that, that lasted quite into adulthood. And then in, when I moved to the Hackney Marshes, which I was talking about earlier on, there was this pylon there that was in these sort of old abandoned Victorian filter beds. It was completely separate from the other pylons, like it had gone away from the herd. Mm. And it, it really had this resonance. People were taking photographs of it all the time and you'd you'd find like marijuana butts underneath the middle and little remains of fires, like people had camped underneath it. It seemed to have some significance. So once one morning I walked there and there was a Rastafarian guy just standing on a bench in front of it, praising the sun and the sun was kind of glancing off the top of this pylon. Uh, and I later discovered that pylons you know, were based on the, the design where you've got this pyramidal structure at the top of certainly the UK pylons. It was based on the idea of Egyptian pylons. And there was one on either edge of, uh, side of the Nile and the sun would set between them and it had this massive significance. So I was fascinated then with this idea that there was a sort of other resonance to pylons the sort of sort of sun worship and the idea of um, um, like like godlike beings i suppose um and so that that really interested me and i noticed that on you know I'm on, i've been on twitter for a long time there's there's pylon of the month and pylon of the day twi twitter feeds there's people take pictures of them all the time people really do find them fascinating and, and get a kind of a, a joy out of them well they're almost like a modern day uh monoliths you know, yeah. like Stonehenge or something like that. You know, we don't we don't put up giant stones. Well, you know, some places we do, but no, you know, we've we've got these these huge steel structures. Yeah, and uh, and and people and they they sort of anchor people to place. So this particular pylon in 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 London, when they moved it down before the Olympics, they wanted to prettify that old filter bed area make it a little bit more arty so they removed the pylon and i felt genuine sorrow it was i was like one of those tree huggers who wants to kind of chain themselves to an oak to stop it being removed and um i suddenly thought about lots of other structures like that that, that anchor us to place i used to live in a town that had this very tall white chimney in the middle of it that people hated in the local area but uh, i always felt that when i saw that as i came in it, over the hill towards town that meant i was home and some of these sort of things like carbuncles that are these ugly intrusions they can also be they can also kind of become part of our the fabric of how we see our landscape and they can become emotionally resonant so i think pylons certainly do that and you're going to get all sorts of strange effects like um, there was a a new bypass being made around a town in the north of england and some guys at night heard some the, the guards who were sort of looking after the site at night heard some strange singing and chanting as they went into this field they saw this pylon with a, a ring of children in Victorian outfits singing Ring a Ring of Roses going around the pylon. More about the ghost sighting with Gareth, Jean, Tim. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> yeah!
At LASIK Plus, we know LASIK is a big decision, and every one of our patients is unique. That's why we customize your LASIK journey to you. I'm so busy right now. We offer a mix of convenient days and times, including 30-minute virtual appointments to fit your schedule. I would love it, but I have astigmatism. We treat thousands of patients with astigmatism every month with great outcomes. LASIK Plus is making your journey towards 2020 vision all about you. So visit MyLASIKOffer.com today to start your LASIK journey. It's time for today's Lucky Land Horoscope with Victoria Cash. Life's gotten mundane, so shake up the daily routine and be adventurous with a trip to Lucky Land. You know what they say, your chance to win starts with a spin. So go to LuckyLandSlots.com to play over 100 social casino-style games for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Get lucky today at LuckyLandSlots.com. Available to players in the U.S., excluding Washington and Michigan. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. Hi, this is James Fox, director of The Phenomenon and Moment of Contact. You're listening to The Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. I've heard stories before about kids singing one kid, many kids. That seems to be a not uncommon problem. So would you explain this kind of ghost encounter more? Yeah, it was a bypass in, in the north of England where they were creating a new road, digging into the landscape. Um, but there was these pylons that were going across the hill. And yeah, there were some night watchmen who were disturbed by the sound of singing and went down to this muddy, boggy field and saw these phantom Victorian children singing Ring a Ring of Roses going around this electricity pylon. Whether the pylon was something that those ghost children were attracted to or not, it was interesting that that pylon had entered into what we call that kind of Victorian kind of folklore, that sort of old folklore we attach in England, certainly to the old ways, to the to the old kind of Merry England. And it had kind of got this new industrial flavour to it. And the fact that it was all happening, this bypass, so this new road that was churning up the memories of the past. I'm interested in that idea, partly that the idea that something like a pylon could be haunted, but also the way that the modern intrusions kind of cut into the old landscape and kind of create these dig up old ghosts, so to speak. Well, that bypass, that it also became like one of the uh, deadliest around with uh, car accidents and such? That one, the, the, so the Stocksbridge bypass became one of the most haunted roads in the north of England. And there was a kind of a headless monk stuff. There's a there's a motorway, uh, the M6, which has a hotspot area. It's, it's got a Bermuda mm. Triangle where all of these strange uh, accidents happen. And yet people keep seeing these sightings of like Romans wandering waist deep. Obviously, the, the ground's higher since the Roman times. It's, assumed that there's some kind of Scottish battle happened. People see soldiers. Those strange effects happen all the time. There's a, a, a service station, not, not just a petrol station, but a kind of a place with the restaurants and stuff off the motorway around in the ring road around London, where they have dug it up and found Roman artefacts. So when you go to the toilets during your road break, there's a whole series of Roman artefacts in a kind of big cabinet between the doorways of the toilet so like this sort of the old and the new seem to bump up against each other in britain certainly sort of unusual ways and creating these elements of the past coming out of new structures well again though i mean you go back and you look at the old stories of haunted roadways and crossroads and things like that and you still have those today you've got you know modern super highways you know multi lanes and yet people are still seeing the ghostly hitchhikers the nun running across the road at the, just the right moment you know stories like that modern times to uh, the ghosts and other supernatural beings hasn't changed too much no. And, and I think these structures bring with them their own new horrors as well. Growing up in England in the late 70s, there were these sort of films they used to show on t TV, public information films that would warn kids away from perilous structures. So there was one where a kid gets his Frisbee back from an electricity pylon and you see his trousers go on fire and he actually sets on fire. There's one called The Ghost of Lonely Water where it's a flooded industrial pit and a kid goes in to reach for his ball and falls in. There's a kind of idea of this in, in England, it's called The Haunted Generation. It was people who grew up with these terrifying films about the perils of the modern industrial world that were kind of fed to us at tea time when we were all having our you know, food and watching children's TV and that seemed to have resonated, particularly in this country, and and where things like, like roads and pylons and factory chimneys and things become electricity substations become these terrifying demonic beasts with these kind of horror kind of direction that I don't think has ever gone away in people of a certain age. 
I've seen that film of the ones where the kids are getting themselves electrocuted in various different ways. They're quite gruesome, aren't they? Bearing in mind they are. going out to, you know, maybe sort of 4 p.m. or so 5 p.m. or something like that while kids were watching other sort of t- television programs. There's one where there's a, a train. It kills multiple children. At the end, you just see bodies lying on either side of the tracks and stuff like that. And this was, seemed like absolutely fine in the late 70s. <laughs> they would show us films like that in school when I was <laughs> in elementary school. School fires. That, that one was one that they showed <laughs> quite a bit. I mean, here you are stuck in an elementary school and they're showing you this terrifying film about being stuck in an elementary school on fire. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I remember those uh, distinctly. Drug films were the most popular uh, later on, yeah. I think the idea was if you if you just instill terror and it will kind of stop. So it seems that these commercials and films were meant to inspire terror and terror was the kind of mechanism by which it would educate us and stop us from straying off the, the beaten path. But what I think it, created was a a sense of horror running through the everyday of the modern world certainly it has done for me and i think that's partly what unofficial britain was about and when i when i say unofficial britain i i I would argue that it's not just necessarily a british thing there's these kind of resonances happen anywhere where there's kind of uh, these sort of urban structures and like you say where people have been at school and warned away from the the many perils of the everyday world and i say rather than changing our behavior maybe it just sort of creates this latent uncanny horror beneath uh, the surface of, of modern life. I like the aspect of unofficial Britain with the uh, the idea of, um, first of all, uh, urban mythologies that were just dis- that are distinct from, say, rural mythologies yet, but still connected. And I remember years ago reading a reading a, a, a novel that went along the same lines that 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 talked about the uh, the magic of of the city and how it existed separate from magic of uh, uh, the countryside. Mm-hmm. And you know, and that's kind of the idea I got, you know, from uh, uh, from reading unofficial uh, Britain. This 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 whole distinct idea of of urban mythologies and legends versus the uh, the country yeah so it's, it's, it began in the victorian era so suddenly you get these um vampires who are sort of representative of, of kind of diseases and uh, they've come from kind of close quarter living and from and from globalization from the empire uh you've got a character in london called spring Hill jack who would haunt the alleyways and urban structures who would leap out at people at night uh, you've got the, the the body snatchers you've got these things that were kind of happening in reality in these crowded cities but they were turned into a sort of form of folklore and it was like that was the first strains of, of, of urban folklore and then people then sort of I got, kind of got used to that and saw nothing weird about a, a haunted, I don't know, railway signal box like D- D- Charles Dickens would write about. But my argument is, yeah, this, this seems to be happening as well now with the Ballardian superstructures of the mid 20th century, where those two are becoming naturally haunted. They're, they've just got to a point, I guess, where so much stuff happens in them. There's so much kind of the blood on the tarmac so much um, there's so much story to them that they become more than just the structures and they're beginning to crumble we're entering into a, into a new sort of digital age and these some of these sort of structures are beginning to become sort of maybe quaint or old-fashioned or part of our memory scape rather than the future uh, and therefore they become again more folkloric so whether that's a haunted tower block or a kind of an industrial estate there's these kind of remnants to folklore so one of my favorites is up in Scotland there's a place where there's a place where they used to build um nuclear um, submarines and like, it was a dock and so the ships would come in and they used to have a cat man this was a guy who would basically a kind of homeless guy who would look after the cats and feed them and for that they'd give them a bit of food now when that industrial period ended and this sort of town was kind of left on its own you suddenly had this idea that there was something lost in that community, something gone, something uh, something e- uh, economically lost. And weirdly, this cat man still exists. So in the 1970s and in the 80s, people kept seeing a cat man, this guy covered in soot and oil, crawling around in this industrial estate at the back of the town called Greenock. 
on the Clyde River near Glasgow. And this character, that people have taken photographs of him. He's a kind of contemporary mythological creature, like Spring Hill Jack in Victorian London. People take photographs of him. The teenagers feed him. There's rumours of him all the time. He used to leap out at people on the way back from the pub. Now he lives in the bus depot. There's pictures of him on the internet with a rat in his mouth crawling from underneath a bus. And... It's a fascinating idea because when I talk to people in that time, there's people who say, well, we don't know if he exists or not. Some people are saying we need to get him helped and we need to sort him out, but no one can find him. Uh, and people are wondering whether it's a, a prank that's gone on for so long or it's become a kind of self-perpetuating uh, folklore, like a tulpa or something that's been imagined into existence. But it speaks a lot about that town. It's about the decline of industry. It's about changes in that town. And the, the people seem to be clinging to this character and he represents a lot more than he is. Some people say he was a Russian sailor who got punched in a fight, fell overboard and had concussion and lost memory and lingered. And some people think he's like a, a cat man, like one of those Japanese fighters after the end of the war who doesn't realise the war's over, still kind of doing his duty in the industrial areas of Greenock. We've got more with Gareth, Gene, Tim, you're in the Paracast. At First Things First, our mission is early childhood, and it's more important to our state than ever. By focusing on the early years, we help Arizona's children reach their full potential. Quality early learning impacts more than the individual child. Schools benefit from more prepared students, businesses with more qualified employees, and communities with engaged citizens. Investments made in the early years today last for decades. Join the First Things First mission and learn more at azchildhoods.com. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere. And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. This is Robert Hastings, author of UFOs and Nukes, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. I rudely interrupted Gareth Reese, and the reason I interrupted him is because I'm rude. But why don't you continue at the point we left off in the last segment? Yes, there are lots of reasons why Catman may exist or may not exist. So he is he is he a piece of urban folklore? In which case, where are these photographs coming from? Why are people seeming to have physical contact with him? Where are these pictures coming from? Why are there sort of numerous accounts? Is he some kind of remnant of the past? So some argument arguments could be that he he was a character, someone who's become sort of detached from the past. Maybe he is the cat man from many years ago who's still carrying on his duties as a cat man, looking after the cats and getting rid of the rats in the kind of town that still remain in the modern era. So it's interesting to speculate on what cat man is. Is he a folkloric figure that has been invented by the town somehow to express their sense of loss, what's happened to them economically, the decline of their shipbuilding, the decline of their industry. So he just haunts these last remnants of industry in this industrial estate at the back of the town, behind the supermarket, behind the superstore. Is he a genuine artifact of the past? Is he someone who has continued his job as a cat man since the 1970s, who looks after the rats and the cats, and he's kind of still carrying on his duties, not realising uh, that the war has ended, so to speak? Uh, or is he something that's necessary to be invented, I guess, from people who uh, are finding it, it their situation difficult? And it's what what is the role of folklore in these sort of spaces there? It seems to be um, it tells a story about now. So this is very distinct from the old rural folklore. It's like a new form of folklore, uh, something that um, expresses what's happened in the last sort of 50 years. Um, so I find that a really interesting story. And it's a kind of it's a modern mystery because people still cannot tell you whether Catman is real. Um, there's like I say, there's photographs, there's rumours, there's videos. Nobody really knows if it's all a great prank or not. And I find that idea of the unknown, something this mysterious happening in a very commonplace and everyday run down back end of a coastal town uh, on, on the Clyde, really fascinating. Well, there's also the... Uh... And, and 
you don't talk about this, you know, in, in your book, but uh, it, it it got me thinking about the uh, like out of place animals in mm. urban environments. You know, here in the United States, you know, you've got like New York with the alligators and the sewers, and uh, you know, some places they're finding like giant, really giant snakes uh, uh, in apartment buildings. And, uh, you know, uh, once again, I mean, you know, you would almost, you know, you'd almost expect to find these, you know, type of creatures, you know, out, out in the country, but, uh, you know, within a city environment, it's, it's strange. Yes, it is. Um, there was one other story I had, I think about that, where in, in Hull and again, in the North of England, there's a sort of a, a an industrial area uh, with water where they keep sitting, where they're seen as werewolf. This couple swear that they saw this creature leap and grab their dog and then leap away and disappear. Um, and it's interesting that they've got this idea of, of creatures haunting these, what I'd call edge lands. They seem to be a very rich, fertile place for modern urban folklore. So where the Hackney Marshes, this Lee Valley area of London that I talked about in my first book, was rich in this. Like I said earlier, there was there was a bear. I mean, what what why was the bear there? There, there used to be a circus that um, used to come to the edge of the river once every year, and some headless bears were genuinely found in the water, two headless bears, and it may have been they were dispatched by the circus because they wanted to get rid of them for some reason. So the fact and the fiction really blur into each other and strange anomalous things happen in cities. So much, there's so much going on that we don't know, so much under the surface. Um, and who knows? That's why, in a way, I write my early books. I was mixing fact with fiction because it really is hard to tell even when you look at the facts of what, what's factual and what's fictional because there could be creatures lurking here. You know, in Britain, we have black cat sightings everywhere. And it's probably, there's so many escaped animals uh, and and escaped pets that it's very likely that these things exist you also wonder here if some people buy pets thinking that it's cool and they realize it's not so cool so they try to rid themselves of it and then a few get together and procreate yeah and 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 then they can sort of exist in these kind of areas of of Britain that you know uh, or anywhere that maybe not exactly countryside and not exactly um, the city or the town um, places that are kind of sort of haunting anyway because they can tumble down and they're they're they're, they're full of dangerous things and mysterious alleyways and bits of ruins and maybe that's a natural habitat for these creatures to exist in or. It's when people who live in cities and big towns go into these edge lands, they suddenly get this primal fear and which is sort of stimulates visions of um, of these animals. So, for example, in, in, in the Hackney Marshes, a, a, a student swore she saw the bear. Uh, this is in 2012. She absolutely saw, swore she saw it. She took a photograph of this sort of hairy beast lurking uh, in this sort of edge land near the old river behind the, the, the soccer pitches. Uh, but it turned out later on to be the Newfoundland dog owned by a guy from a rock band british rock band at the time so they actually found the, the cause of it and it was just this i i would argue that it was her sense that this bear the story the narrative of the bear had kind of seeped through into the consciousness and so therefore when people see something they see the bear so maybe the folklore feeds the visions and you know like i say this is where everything gets a bit blurry and uh, and, and stories kind of matter and story a story about a place affects us of how we experience a place when we go into it well, you think also if enough people talk about something, if somebody sees something strange, they're going to try to apply something understandable to it, and so they take the folklore. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I you know it's 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 like a, 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 one of the stories in Unofficial Britain was was a guy who who was he he was told this house was haunted near where he lived, and he was he was terrified of it. And it had this awful resonance for him, and he would get really scared going near it. And later on in life. Uh, he realized that his friend told him that the wrong that wasn't the house it was a different house so the, the the friend imbuing this house with this kind of dark energy had created the energy and therefore the person had effectively had the experience you would have with an actual haunted house and then it was the story that did the that, that changed it it was the perceiver of the object that changed the way the object resonated with them you're saying in a sense here that the words can precede the reality I think so. I think we see the world in in, in sort of uh, story terms. I think we 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 see the world. We, we we kind of experience the world in stories and narratives and symbols and myths. I think that's how humans 
experience the world and no matter how kind of advanced and technological we've become and how detached we think and how secular we think we are i don't i don't believe that we have changed in terms of our consciousness and the way that we express reality i think we're the same people as we're telling stories around the fires you know six thousand ten thousand years ago we just have a few fancier tricks yeah it also has me thinking, though, of, say, like these uh, uh, abandoned industrial areas uh, in the middle of cities where you have blocks of abandoned buildings, fields with tall grass and everything like that. And those do become really a focus point of of strange stories and uh especially uh, uh, kids and teenagers <laughs> going in, trying to see what they can find. Yeah. Um, it's, it's There's a, a, a book that inspired me, uh, the title of Unofficial Britain. Um, it's called The Unofficial Countryside by Richard Maybe. And he talks about ed these edgelands and the way they've become overgrown and abandoned and create their own kind of, I guess, a version of nature um that becomes fascinating that's full of kind of mystery and sometimes it's a new species or, or hybrids of, of plants um there's a guy a, a dutch guy called wilfred hujebeck uh, i think that's how you pronounce it and he um another influence on me was his he had a website called crypto forestry and he talked about the crypto forest these were these untamed unkempt return to nature parts of uh, of our world where they weren't official forests, they were new forests, future forests or abandoned areas, even the bits in the middle of the verges between roads, um, but also larger expanses, industrial areas being reclaimed. And these were kind of forests that have their own kind of interest. Maybe they've got their own kind of definition. That's the, the, and they've got their own botanical interests and combinations of plants and animals and folklore. Uh, and they're, they're, they, they, they're a kind of a new type of place that's emerged sort of from the post-industrial era that wouldn't have been around hundreds of years ago. So in a way, they've got their own character, they've got their own folklore and their own kind of, their own, um, in, their own sort of story, I suppose. It sounds like something positive. I'm positive mm -hmm. we'll have more with Gareth, Gene and Tim. You're in The Paracast. At First Things First, our mission is early childhood, and it's more important to our state than ever. By focusing on the early years, we help Arizona's children reach their full potential. Quality early learning impacts more than the individual child. Schools benefit from more prepared students, businesses with more qualified employees, and communities with engaged citizens. Investments made in the early years today last for decades. Join the First Things First mission and learn more at azchildhoods.com. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. This is Jacques Vallée. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So, folks, we have one more segment to do on the main show with Gareth Reese, and then he will be back for the After the Paracast podcast, exclusively for Paracast Plus members. Check theparacast.plus if you haven't joined already, okay? All right. Let us continue exploring folklore, modern folklore. And you mentioned the word in your bio and everything. We saw you mentioning the word magic. Do you think there is real magic in our world? I think it's possible to have magic in, in the world. It's just about the person who's experiencing the place of the environment. I feel like we can rekindle some of the what we think of as lost magic. We feel that somehow we've had a, a disenchanted world that we live in now. It feels like the electric light has got into all the dark corners 
of our physical world around us and therefore possibly into our imagination and illuminated everything to sort of remove the fairies and ghosts and elves and beasts and, and terrors and sort of strange things that lurk in the dark recesses. And that may be true in a certain sense, but I don't really believe that's true because I feel my view of magic is it's something that happens when you engage really deeply with a landscape, when you meditate upon it, when you allow synchronicities and connections and things to happen, when you experiment with the way that you move through a place and how long you linger in there. And suddenly I think magical things happen. Connections begin to be made. Stories begin to appear. Certainly it happened for me when I went to the marshes and began to really walk and explore and take different directions and linger in places and notice the micro details. Suddenly, incredible stories came out of the of, of almost seemingly nothing. And I felt like resonance is in a place that I'd never felt before. And I felt like the, play, the, the, the world had become enchanted again and it had become magical. And my experiments with that continued because you could say that, well, of course, in an, in an industrial semi edge land like that, you've got this, you've got all these exciting and interesting things that not everybody has in their everyday life, right? They just live in these roads and, and they've got the houses and they've got the paths and the sidewalks and the shops. But that's why I wrote Car Park Life that was looking at um, shopping spaces and trying to think, well, can I extract, can I make magic out of the most bland and boring and uh, seemingly identical? non-places and i could I, I wrote a whole book about it i came away from every single car lot with notes and notes and notes stuff that you know you could say well you're making it up but i wasn't i was i was looking at the place and i was feeling these things i was seeing these different connections and i was excited and feel felt energized and i felt like everything was suddenly alive like the the, the this ina inanimate world had suddenly become conscious and i know that's because my consciousness was engaging with it so i'm not necessarily it was that it was becoming actually alive i don't know but that's how i feel and that's what it seems a very fertile way to uh, understand our uh, everyday places and if more people had that i think the world would become a, a much more interesting place do you think under these circumstances you were interacting with something real, possibly a universal consciousness? I do feel like that increasingly. And I feel like and certainly a, a, a sort of sense that everything has meaning and everything is is interesting and has a purpose and even things that people would dismiss, you know, um, it's like the Philip K. Dick thing of like the signs of the divine show up in the in the trash stratum, the idea that even in the kind of in the kind of the, the kind of tumble down or the bland or the boring or the retail or the trashy areas of town, there's all this there's this magical stuff happening. It's just as much magic can happen, just as much fertile stories and and excitement and weirdness and resonance and and uncanniness can happen in those places as they can in a wood or a bluebell kind of strewn meadow. So I feel like they're exciting and uncanny and unusual resonances can happen in very bland or boring, ostensibly boring places, as they can in obviously awe-inspiring places where, you know, great mountains and forests and meadows and things. And I feel like if people understood that this potential was there in their everyday spaces, they would, they would find the world more exciting. For example, during the lockdown, everyone had to uh, just walk in a certain distance from their home in allotted times. And suddenly everyone became a kind of local landscape expert and noticed all these strange anomalies around where they lived and noticed the micro details and, and took different routes to experiment and just to sort of enjoy where they lived a bit more. And you don't need to travel far and wide to sort of find excitement and adventure and to sort of and to travel. Maybe people would be a lot nicer to each other if they more or less got into that. I think so. I think it would take a lot of, of, the, of the kind of the snobbery and division away from, yeah, how people, where people live and how they live. And the idea that there's some kind of pretty authentic place, a place that's full of meaning and beauty and that these other places are ugly and, 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 and I've got nothing of worth. And I just don't believe that. I think, like I say, every, everywhere can be interesting and everywhere has a story to tell. And, and, and that's as much about the, the viewer and the person who's experiencing the place as anything else. But that liberates everyone because it means that everyone, no matter what conditions they live in, have this potential to have kind of excitement and magic around them, even if they feel that they're kind of in a deprived area or or they're in a place that's sort of been dismissed as, as, as nothing -y and, you know, not worth visiting. I think there's lots of exciting places to travel right under our noses that are ignored by everyone else. This was my idea behind Unofficial Britain, that behind that kind of touristy Britain, there's this other really fascinating Britain that most people who visited wouldn't bother to look at. But is it your imagination playing around or is it something that getting into the right state of mind, meditating or something else, tapping into something that is real. 
my view in it is that nothing i'm not really sure what is real if we think if we go down to the micro detail it's just atoms and clusters and bits and quantum strangeness and so like everything's a kind of version of reality that's put together by the perceiver and therefore everything has that malleable quality everything can kind of change and become dramatic or, or strange yes it's part of the imagination my view on the imagination is imagination is an important and fundamental tool it's that sort of right brain thinking that humans need to reconnect with a bit more rather than this logical and materialist view of, of reality which i don't really i'm as i'm getting older and i'm doing a lot more of this kind of writing and exploring i'm getting less attached to and i'm beginning to think that if we start to see the kind of the metaphor and the intrinsic resonance of places and the holistic view of the world, that kind of emotional experience of a place, that to me feels as much as reality as this kind of broken down into component parts kind of thinking that we seem to be, seem to be dominating at the moment in the world. Seeing the whole as opposed to the parts. Yeah. All right. Listen, tell them listeners if they want to know more about the things you're doing, what you're working on in the future, where can they check you out? So if they Google Gareth E. Reese they will find me and if they look on um x as it's now known under hackney marshman they will find some of my tweets and if they go to unofficialbritain.com it's not a site i'm updating a lot at the moment but it's got lots of my past work and other work of other people that i like on there and it's got some contact details yeah and so they can look out for me at various bookshops or order my book in and any of the books that they read by me really will connect them to some of the ideas we've been talking about today what are you working on next so at the moment, I'm filling a notebook with uh, strange kind of stories, and I'm going back to my old walking uh, and exploring the local area. I'm thinking about writing something that's fictional next. Uh, I'm thinking about a novel that's kind of to do with the ideas we're talking about today, about what would future archaeologists make of the ruins of the infrastructural world we have today, um, and maybe combining that with a, a sort of a, a story about someone undergoing radical environmental change. I'm, I'm still working on it. For this book, I'm, go I'm going to stop herring around the, the country. You can find us on Twitter, which is now called X, and maybe we call it something else, if Elon Musk changes his mind, and Threads and Facebook. Look for The Paracast. That's The Paracast. You can also buy branded merchandise with four logos to choose from, from the Paracast.store or the Paracast.shop. takes you to the same place. Check out also our subscription service, the Paracast Plus at theparacast.plus. You'll get the show completely free of network ads, a little bit better audio quality, and the exclusive after the Paracast podcast where we cover areas we couldn't get into on the main show and have other guests too. In fact, Gareth will be back for that. Check out the lowest prices ever. You can sign up in a couple of minutes. The Paracast dot plus once again. The Paracast dot plus. Gareth Reese, thank you for introducing us to your world. Thank you for joining us on the Paracast. Thank you for having me. Paracast, featuring Gene Steinberg, is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in the Paracast. At First Things First, our mission is early childhood, and it's more important to our state than ever. By focusing on the early years, we help Arizona's children reach their full potential. Quality early learning impacts more than the individual child. Schools benefit from more prepared students, businesses with more qualified employees, and communities with engaged citizens. Investments made in the early years today last for decades. Join the First Things First mission and learn more at azchildhoods.com. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. Ch -ch 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 -chumba. That's right, ChumbaCasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Ch -ch 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 -chumba. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchases, over limited by law, 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.